Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in dairy nutrition. Uh, we're back with the next episode of our Journal Club, but we're doing something a little bit different uh, this week. We are at the Tri-State Nutrition Conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and we're actually reviewing proceedings of presentations given here at, at the uh, uh, conference. And we're here with our uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, Bill Weiss. Bill, welcome. I'd also like to uh, introduce my co-host. I got Dr. Clay Zimmerman with me once again today. Thank you for joining me, Clay. Thanks, Scott. Uh, and the paper we're going to be reviewing today was written by um, Alex Ristoff from uh, Penn State University. The title is called Practical Aspects of Reducing Carbon Footprint by Dairy Farms Through Feeding. So, Bill, uh, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and lead us into the discussion. Okay. New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. First, you know, Alex has been doing this work for many, many years, so he's kind of the, the resident or one of the resident experts in, in the U.S. And I guess I'd like to start off with what, what most of the, your, your papers on methane mitigation. So how big of a problem is meth animal agriculture methane, or more specifically dairy industry generated methane? For the U.S., I mean, it's a little different globally, but for the U.S., uh, livestock and that includes enteric and manure emissions and these are mostly from cattle although we have uh, manure em uh, et methane emissions from pig manure uh, is the number one source of uh, methane uh, it competes with oil and gas uh, for first and second place they are very close actually uh, so it if anyone is concerned with uh, methane and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, livestock will be uh, on top of their list for mitigation. So how, you know, we're, we're pretty intensive in this country. How, how practically, how low do you think, what percent reduction do you think is, is practically yeah. possible? If we did everything we know within the economic constraints, what, what yeah. do you think is possible? So I hear all the time uh, carbon neutral uh, agriculture and carbon neutral uh, livestock or dairy. I think this is not possible. Um, I mean, mother words can easily put uh, numbers together uh, and uh, show carbon neutrality. In a practical dairy farm, I don't think this yeah. is possible. And I think it's time that, uh, you know, we and others uh, write uh, some something about it because the public seems to be uh, kind of misled on this carbon neutrality um, thing. What is possible? Um, several things. <coughs> so, so the mitigation can take several directions. Uh, obviously, my area is nutrition, so we'll talk more about this. And and I think nutrition actually can have uh, the largest impact. Uh, but there are management practices that uh, can be added on top of nutrition. Uh, there are genetic selections that uh, people have done that can also add a little bit. <coughs> and then you have the manure site, uh, which is um, quite attractive for uh, uh, cutting methane uh, down. So when you put all this together, 
Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's not uh, impossible, but there are many ifs. Uh, and if everything works the way we would like it to work, and again, we can talk more about this, you can probably get up to 70% um, reduction in total methane from a intensive dairy production okay. system. So, so substantial. So, uh, it is very substantial. Okay. But this is what I call the <coughs> best case best scenario. Case. Yeah. yeah, probably will never yeah. be obtained. But yeah. I, I don't see it, but on paper that's possible. Yeah. Alex, another term we hear a lot of is net zero. Could you maybe talk about the difference between net zero and, and carbon neutral, and, and is that possible? Uh, you, you have to ask uh, the people who throw those <laughs> terms around uh, right. what they mean. <laughs> to me, they mean the same thing, that okay. uh, input and outputs are uh, equal, so you don't have emissions, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions uh, from a production system or a farm. Uh, that's, that's what they mean. Okay. Yeah. If, if we if we get back to methane, let's yeah. just kind of start at the top of the list on yeah. on neutral we'll concentrate on nutrition right now on on carbohydrates. How can what what can we do on carbohydrates and what do you again uh, within the cost and health cow health all these constraints? What what kind of reductions are we looking at? So if you talk about nutrition again, uh, <coughs> the list would start with. Uh, typical dietary interventions, which uh, is not going to gain us much, mm -hmm. simply because, I mean, we know what we are doing. Yeah. It's not uh, that we are somewhere where we don't have uh, quality feeds or uh, don't have access to feeds. Uh, there are maybe still some uh, <coughs> opportunities there. Um, for example, we, we compare forages and forage digestibility. We do know that... Uh, as forage digestibility increases, uh, what we call a methane yield or methane intensity, which is either on a dry methane intake basis <coughs> or on a milk production basis, will decrease. So when you feed a 60% forage diet uh, and you are having higher digestibility uh, forages versus lower quality forages, then you will be gaining maybe 10-15% uh, difference in, in terms of intensity. Now, don't let's not forget that methane is produced from fermentable material, yeah, yeah. and the more digestible that material yeah, yeah. will be more methane, but more the animal milk. will be producing more, more will be probably eating less because, uh, you know, it will meet uh, their requirements, uh, energy requirements, and so on. Um, other things that uh, traditionally can be done is, for example, starch versus NDF. We do know, of course, that uh, starch makes <coughs> less methane than uh, NDF. We have a good example with uh, feedlot cattle that are fed 90-95% grain and they produce half uh, the methane that uh, a normal dairy cow or a beef cow will produce. We, as I said uh, yesterday, we d did uh, look at starch. Uh, there is some opportunity there. Of course, we are all concerned with fat. Uh, <coughs> But starch will increase milk production, will decrease fat, probably not as uh, drastically as we think, uh, and uh, total energy corrected milk may actually be increased. So once you have that kind of situation, you will have less <coughs> methane, not just as total methane, but also as uh, in methane intensity. And we have shown this uh, with a study where we had up to 40% starch diets. Um, other <coughs> feed manipulations are going to be very difficult. Uh, of course, we know lipids and oil uh, can decrease uh, methane. Now there you have to be careful with, again, with fat and uh, upsetting rumen function, uh, microbial synthesis, and uh, this kind of things. So I don't think uh, fat uh, is going to be a practical tool uh, because normally we feed already enough fat. Mm -hmm. And if you exceed 6%, 5 6%, then you are getting in that gray zone uh, for uh, uh, dis disturbed uh, rumen function. We did uh, have a project, we still have that project, screening feeds for their methane mitigation potential, what we call it. Um, 
that started with uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, interest uh, in with us and, and with um, the founders. Uh, after we screened, I think probably over 70 or 80 different feeds that we normally feed, and then we compared diets, uh, reconstituted diets based on these emissions versus what we have measured in the animal, uh, we found that this may not be such a great uh, idea. Mm -hmm and uh, doesn't, doesn't really reflect the animal emissions. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there is really not a lot of difference <coughs> between individual feeds. The one that stood out was whole cotton seed because of the oil and whole uh, soybeans. Uh, but when those are put in a normal diet at 5-7% of dry matter, they really don't make that much difference on the emissions. So the last thing we have is uh, feed additives. And, and that's a large topic. It will take two podcasts to, <laughs> <laughs> to get. Be glad to have you back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess bef before we switch to additives, which we're going to yeah. go to, but, yeah. you know, forage makes up the biggest component. Yeah. Uh, is there much difference, say, between a, a almost all, all from the forage, all corn silage, all alfalfa, all grass, where, you know, you're talking maybe yeah. 50, 60 yeah. percent of the diet? Does so that make a good, difference? So good point, Bill. Uh, I was going to i get to that, but uh, skipped it. So corn silage definitely, because again of the, the starch, starch in it, uh, um, produces less methane compared to, compared to all forages, all other forages. Alpha, alpha, grass silage. We went, we had a project a couple of years ago, what we call alternative forages. Uh, we went through uh, six or seven different <coughs> forages that are uh, not, uh, completely um, uh, foreign to the dairy producers in the Northeast. None of them actually um, uh, made less methane than corn silage. Uh, and in fact, some of them uh, produced more methane. Uh, alpha alpha is the second uh, after corn silage in terms of methane uh, because of the protein and uh, also um, lower, actually overall lower digestibility of fiber. Uh, so, uh, corn silage will be number one. Okay. The difference is not great. Uh, probably, again, we are talking about 10 to 15 percent. There are some data also about BMR corn silage uh, that produces less methane uh, than uh, traditional corn silage. Uh, but, of course, you have to put all this in a, yeah. in a bigger equation with all other consequences exactly. of feeding BMR. Yeah. So, so Alex, did you do any work with small grain silages? Yes, uh, small grain silages. Uh, we did look at uh, wheat silage, uh, but of course, uh, pretty much no one in the Northeast or in Pennsylvania makes wheat silage, so nobody knew how to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, we 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 made the bar si bar barley silage too. That uh, was completely uh, un. Unpalatable <laughs> and uh, <laughs> pretty much straw, so we didn't we didn't actually feed it to the cows. But yes, small grain uh, silages. When you know how to do it, when you have enough starch and you don't feed, you are not feeding straw. Uh, that will probably um, uh, compared to grass silage, for example, will have uh, lower emissions because again of the starch. Yeah. Uh, sorghum was uh, BMR. Sorghum was one of the things that we looked. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because of the sugars, but unfortunately, when we ensile uh, it, almost all of the sugars oh are gone, and there is very little to no starch at all. So again, it was worse than corn silage. Okay. Yeah. Well, if we we kind of switch to additives, I guess mm -hmm. there's a couple I'd like to talk about. Some sure. are not legal yet in the U.S., but it's yeah. and one is this NOP, which I never know what it means. So <laughs> I'm just going to call it <laughs> NOP. Yeah. But you first, you, you've done a quite a bit of work on that. Could first the mode of action and then maybe some of the results you're seeing. And, and if you know the regulatory status, I don't know if you know that. Right yes, now. sure, sure. So 3-NOP is 3-nitro-oxypropanol. <laughs> NOP is <laughs> easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, actually the commercial name is Bover. It has been approved in Europe. I know it's approved in uh, Latin American countries. I think in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's either approved or they are approving it now. Um, it was developed by uh, DSM in, uh, in Europe. 
Uh, we at Penn State have done all the animal uh, dairy work uh, in, in North America. Uh, most of the beef work was done in Lethbridge uh, by Karen Boschemin. So <coughs> the mode of action, it's a very simple molecule, small molecule, uh, which is advantageous actually, one of the advantages. It attacks the last enzyme of uh, methane synthesis. All the archaea, which is the methanogens in the rumen, have that. Uh, this is the what we uh, call it hydrogenotrophic pathway of methane synthesis. Uh, the MCR enzyme is very important. It's found in all archaea. So it actually attacks that last step of methane synthesis, blocks that enzyme. Um, it is effective. We know that. Um, <coughs> Our data show, and I'm going to talk about this uh, today, uh, later this afternoon, uh, our data show about 29-30% uh, reduction in, in all these metrics that we talk about, total methane emissions, on a dry meta methane yield, or on milk production. We struggled quite a bit to find where that energy goes, if there is energy savings uh, from methane, and in theory there are. Um, our meta-analysis of our own data show increase of about uh, small increase, 0.2 percent units increase in milk fat. We didn't see any effect on milk yield. Um, dry methane intake in some cases may drop down a little bit. Statistically in our case wasn't uh, affected, uh, but they show particularly in beef cattle that there <coughs> may be some uh, decrease in uh, dry meat intake. And typically, Bill, when you have a small increase in dry meat intake and no effect on milk production, you improve efficiency. Yeah. Feed efficiency is improved. Uh, not in our uh, data. Uh, again, only uh, milk fat uh, was, was increased. Um, so <coughs> DSM has done tons of work in terms of uh, where is that compound uh, going, what is the metabolism of it. Uh, they did isotope work, for example, and 85% of it is going into CO2, so it's very quickly uh, metabolized. In fact, um, uh, when we did these studies, uh, we looked at the uh, diurnal pattern of uh, methane uh, mitigation, and we feed once a day, and the compound is mixed with the feed. So after feeding in the morning, obviously when the cows come back from milking, they eat a lot. So the mitigation effect goes up to 40%. Then over the day, <coughs> by, by the next morning before feeding, they almost don't eat anything. The mitigation effect is gone. So the compound is so rapidly metabolized that if it doesn't enter the rumen continuously, it uh, doesn't have any effect. Uh, and that uh, is applicable to pasture systems, for example, uh, where cows, you know, don't get it. Uh, they, there is no mechanism of feeding feeding that compound. So really, um, uh, if if you are looking at an effect, it's going to be for uh, confined systems where the cows will have access to feed with the compound all the time. Is it, is it stable in the TMR then over a day? Or uh, yeah, we didn't see any. Uh, any uh, differences in terms of uh, the compound seeding 24 hours uh, with, the, with the feed. We had some concerns about um, volatility. Uh, we did a study, and palatability, because of the dry matter intake effect. So we did a study where we looked at palatability and volatility, and we didn't <coughs> find, surprising to me actually, because uh, <laughs> when you enter that barn you can smell it, but uh, wasn't um, enough to, to detect any differences. Um, and I think they made some uh, changes to, to, the, uh, to the premix, uh, com the commercial product, and, and that uh, addresses this, this problem. What, what kind of feeding <coughs> rates do you look at typically? Oh, uh, inclusion rate? Yeah. yeah. So again, we did uh, those response uh, studies up to 200 uh, milligrams ppm, milligrams per kilogram <coughs> inclusion uh, from 40 to 200. Uh, the optimum was around 60 to 80. Um, I think what uh, DSM is uh, uh, recommending now is 60. 
uh, but anywhere between 60 and 80 you will have uh, uh, the effect. It will slightly increase over up to 100, 150, but it won't justify adding mm -hmm. that much compound anymore. So we're only yeah. talking a gram or two a day of actual feeding. Ab about that, yeah, so yeah, yeah, for a typical cow, yeah. Okay. Gram to two grams, up yep. to two grams, yeah. Uh, yes, on the, the en I'm more, more interested on energy than a lot of people, but, <laughs> you know, you're only yeah. talking, a, it's a big reduction in methane, but it's probably only about 2 or 3% more um, ME from the DE stage. So is that even measurable, or do we just have to believe the, the thermodynamics and say we, we know it's more efficient, but we can't prove it? Yeah, don't uh, forget this thermodynamics are all in vitro stuff. Yeah. The stoichiometry yeah. is an in vitro uh, <laughs> protocol uh, that, uh, at least in our case, has been proven to be wrong. Mm -hmm. We could not account for, in, in all of these studies, we could not account up to for up to 60% of the hydrogen okay. when you do the stoichiometry of uh, the VFAs and uh, methane and, and all that. Bill, in one case, actually the first study that was in published in PNAS, uh, we had uh, increased the uh, body weight of the cows. Again, these are continuous design uh, trials. Uh, so we thought maybe, you know, they're getting, gaining more body weight, but uh, that never repeated. Uh, so across all the studies, the only thing that we have seen statistically is uh, the milk fat. fat. In some cases, it uh, wasn't statistical, but was a trend or a numerical mm -hmm. difference. But of course, when you put all this together in a meta-analysis, uh, it showed up. And, and uh, even, you know, that small increase in milk fat cannot account for the energy. No that Not supposedly is yeah. saved. Yeah. Uh, another additive you talk a lot, and I don't know if this is allowed mm -hmm. or not, uh, or if it needs a regulatory approval, but that's the algae and the bromo farm. Oh yeah, I should uh, talk about the regulatory approval. <laughs> so in the US, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what is right now, but uh, FDA uh, told them it has to be approved as a drug not as a feed additive. You were talking about NOP. About yeah. still 3NOP. Three, three yeah. uh, now Elanco is uh, dealing with 3NOP uh, in the US. And we keep talking with them uh, for a number of reasons. Last time I talked to them was probably February and they said in few months. <laughs> so next time I talk to them, it will be a few months again. <laughs> but it's coming, I, I don't see, you know, uh, again, there, there is nothing standing in the, in the way of the approval for this compound. We have thrown the milk, dumped the milk from all these studies, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. over the years. Yeah, I, <laughs> I've done a few of those too, where you throw it away. I have to uh, say something else about 3NOP. We do have some concerns about adaptation. Um, it's in our papers and probably in this paper as well. Uh, we have seen uh, in this long-term 10-15 week studies, again, this is not a very long term, but that's what we can do. Uh, we can throw uh, milk from uh, full lactation of so many cows. Uh, we have seen some decrease of the efficacy over time. There was a paper that I'm gonna show today from uh, Holland, uh, Wageningen, that uh, fed uh, uh, 3NOP for a full year, and they, uh, there was a definite decrease in the efficacy in one of the stages wasn't completely clear whether it's the changing in the diet. So for example, that's another thing with all these feed additives. Efficacy uh, may depend on diet, mm -hmm. NDF mm -hmm. versus starch. 3-NOP definitely is uh, less effective on higher NDF diets. So the more forage you feed, there will be, uh, uh, le it will be less effective. So they, if you look at their data, th there is definitely uh, some <coughs> indication of adaptation, uh, but uh, can be interpreted in different ways. Um, so that's that's a concern, not just with this, with all feed additives. Can you quantify that, Alex? Uh, well, <laughs> the rumen, as you know, has evolved over millions of years with uh, the microbiome. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, many feed additives that are active or do something uh, in vitro, when we feed them to the animal, either the effect is too small or over time it just disappears because the microbes adapt to it. Mm -hmm. Again, there are three different pathways of methane synthesis in the rumen. Whether the microbes 
adapt to break this compound before it affects uh, methane uh, synthesis, or there is a shift to a different pathway of methane synthesis. That's not clear at this point. So would you feed it during the dry period? And would that create an adaptation back? Or? Well, adap if there is adaptation, the, more, the longer you feed it, there will be you know, clear, right. more clear adaptation. Now, if there is adaptation, there may be some uh, things you can do to either avoid it or uh, minimize this effect. Um, you can have a schedule of feeding this compound, uh, certain uh, period breakups and periods of time where you don't feed it and then feed it again, uh, or you feed different feed additives, uh, you switch them. So that's still to be uh, studied. Okay. Um, about the bromoform, of course, that's, that's the other <coughs> thing that really works. <coughs> um, it started with uh, the red seaweeds. Uh, there are two of them, two species. We have done, again, oh, quite a bit of work with this. Uh, unfortunately, apart from the practicality of the thing, uh, growing the seaweed, uh, transporting it, including it in the diet, uh, stability, bromoform is, is not stable. Uh, apart from the environmental issues, like uh, bromoform is a ozone depleting compound, or uh, in fact, it's a carcinogen as well. Uh <coughs> With this one, clearly we can see adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we have a one year, uh, well, full lactation study with uh, uh, asparagopsis, and we are at about 200 days, and I'm going to show again this uh, data, that, that's fresh data just coming from, uh, from the study, and the effect started at about 60-65%. We never get the 90 or 80% yeah, yeah, yeah. that people are talking about, and now it's down to about 20-25%. Yeah. Mm. Dry meta intake has been reduced, and that's the problem with this. Um, now, I mean, of course, they are talking about extracts. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, um, there are some, uh, uh, there's, there's some work uh, of uh, feeding bromoform by itself uh, through uh, slow release uh, devices in the rumen, particularly for pasture <coughs> systems. That may prevent the dry matter uh, uh, intake effect if it's a palatability issue, uh, which probably is at the end of the day. But we have definitely seen with uh, asparagopsis uh, drop in dry matter intake, and of course milk production drops down. Um, we didn't see any uh, changes in um, um, components, uh, but uh, the, the adaptation is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, um, um, milk iodine increases yeah, quite dramatically. My next question. Yeah, bromide um, also, although bromide doesn't seem to be a compound that is uh, on the uh, radar, um, but uh, iodine definitely yeah. is controlled. So there are a lot more issues with this than with 3NOP. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and this is more of a philosophical question, mm -hmm. not a scientific. You know, these additives are going to cost money. <laughs> they may or may not improve energetic efficiency. Yeah. So the farmer is buying. Who, who pays for this? <laughs> uh, good question. <laughs> Uh, that has to be resolved. Uh, that, I mean, farm, the farmer is not going to pay for yeah, it exactly. and shouldn't pay for no. it. Uh, so if uh, we all are so concerned with uh, greenhouse gases and uh, climate change, we should pay at least part of it. The companies, they want to recover their investment, obviously. Uh, what I hear about 3NOP is that's going to be, uh, uh, Elanco hasn't said anything officially, but what is in Europe, the situation in Europe, it's about the cost of one kilo of milk. Okay. So whatever, you know, cost uh, the, the milk price is, uh, that's about where it's going to be, which is quite significant. No. Okay. Uh, there are examples how this can work. Carbon markets is, of course, one of them. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not into that uh, kind of uh, stuff, so I don't know much about it. Um, I know that uh, a lot of people will make a lot of money on the way there. <laughs> <laughs> so how is this going to help uh, farmers and consumers? I'm not yeah. quite sure. But Elanco already has an example with uh, Romanzin that uh, uh, they 
claimed uh, carbon credits down in a uh, 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 Texas dairy farm uh, by reducing emissions by something like 5%, okay. which is e extremely strange yeah. to me. Yeah. But in fact, you know, if there is somebody to pay yeah. for that, yeah, why not? Yeah. I think a major driver will be the consumer. Uh, if we want to pay a little more for low carbon uh, dairy or meat, uh, I mean, that should compensate uh, using those compounds. Yes, another thing, you know, a lot of these farmers now have biodigesters. Will yeah. these additives carry over to reduce methane yield from manure, or do they are they done being active by the time they're secreted or excreted by yeah, the cow? Yeah, that uh, question has been asked, and there is data that show that they they don't no effect come in manure. Okay, so there is no effect on uh, methane from digesters. Okay, that particular compound is completely gone and digested very quickly. Okay. Other other compounds that people are looking at to maybe incorporate into the manure uh, to decrease methane. Yes, during the di to digester. No, you it? actually no, you want to. You want to keep it. it. But if you don't have a digester, right. is there? If you added? don't have a yeah. digester, yeah. Uh, there are there are methods or uh, <laughs> processes that you can um, decrease methane from manure. And again, that's a, uh, in in our dairy system, it's about 50-50 uh, when you handle manure as a liquid, the, the way we do typically, uh, there is as much uh, methane em emitted from manure as from the animal. So um, digesters is one way, obviously. Uh, you capture that methane and you use it for something else. Uh, cover, uh, covering the manure and either directing that methane to, to for some other purposes or flaring it. So you turn it into CO2, which is a lower um, uh, global uh, um, warming potential gas uh, and uh, acidification is a actually very practical way of and they do it in uh, Europe. If you bring the pH down uh, you will decrease methane emissions quite significantly um, and also ammonia yeah. and nitrous oxide uh, losses. Uh, other feed additives I'm not aware of, but I'm, I'm sure people, oh actually yes there is a feed additive from Ireland that um, we tested. Unfortunately, it didn't show the results that they uh, were claiming in our system, but I, I guarantee you that there will be a lot more additives for manure, decreasing at methane emissions from manure. And he said it's about half the, half the total methane from half dairy farms. From dairy farms, yeah. In beef systems, it's very small, 80% yep. uh, or Ninety percent are coming from the animal. Yeah. I guess another question. I'm not a microbiologist, yep. but you know, we're we reduce methane. We're changing stuff. Does this affect like microbial protein synthesis, fiber digestion, mm -hmm. all these other things? Again, maybe not a lot, but a mm -hmm. little bit for the negative or or, or positive. So like. we have not seen that. Um, not NDF digestibility, total digestibility, not just <laughs> NDF. All other nutrients haven't changed. Now, in theory, when you inhibit methane, a VFA profile will change. Uh, for example, there will be more uh, propionate, and, and that's energetically, of course, that's, that's uh, good for the animal. We have not seen it. The, the thing that we typically see is actually butyrate increasing. Um, uh, we have talked about this in our papers and the mechanisms and so on. But there seems to be slight increase in butyrate with all these inhibited uh, methane uh, studies, including 3-NOP and bromoform, and we have done other ones too. Um, so unless dry methane intake is, is changed or affected, the, the changes in rumen fermentation are not that drastic or dramatic okay. to, to change anything uh, in the animal. I should have uh, mentioned, uh, you didn't ask me, but uh, there is a whole bunch of other feed additives that are not inhibitors, uh, plant extracts, yeah. and these kind of things that uh, none of them really has proven, um, even the claims that the companies have. We have done a bunch of these trials. Uh, very disappointing for uh, the, the manufacturers, obviously, but. Uh, I don't think uh, they will be a game changer um, or they were going to have any uh, 
at, at least at this point, that have any effect on the carbon footprint of milk. Yeah. So, so Alex, the yeah. <coughs> the increase in in butyrate <coughs> production is that <coughs> is that why you think that you're seeing the increase in milk fat? O obviously, butyrate is a precursor of uh, of uh, milk fat, and that's one of the explanations we have. Yes. Uh, why is butyrate? Because butyrate, in fact, butyrate synthesis produces less hydrogen than acetate. Uh, obviously more than propionate. Propionate doesn't produce any hydrogen. So I think the rumen ad uh, uh, adapts <coughs> to, the, to that uh, situation and that's why it uh, pumps out less hydrogen because that hydrogen is not going to go into met methane. And eventually we know that if uh, there is too much hydrogen in the rumen, that is going to inhibit fermentation. So I think this is an adaptation mechanism to these uh, compounds that inhibit methane. Mm. Yeah. Do you think there is any either positive or negative synergy among additives? Like if you added in, I'm just as an example, NLP and bromoform. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's <coughs> just an example. That's uh, you open a can, can of worms, uh, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that that's something that uh, needs to be studied a lot more because. The, the data that are out there are pretty controversial. In some cases, you will have um, an additive effect that I talk about this in, in my papers when you are trying to calculate all these things. Of, uh, obviously, you know, farmers can use more than one feed additive. Um, and in some cases, they show synergism. So we don't, we don't have a clear picture. Obviously, you want to combine compounds <coughs> that have different mode of action mm -hmm. uh, so they don't act in one way, uh, complement each, each other. But uh, we need a lot more studies to, to know whether these compounds really work together or, or there is no, uh, no effect, uh, no further improvement. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what about with monensin? Uh, monensin. Monensin doesn't really affect methane. The only way monensin uh, decreases <coughs> methane is through uh, dec decreasing dry meat intake and shifting a little bit the fermentation towards propionate. But the true effect is feed efficiency and dry meat intake and feed efficiency. Dry meat intake and feed efficiency. So the 5% that I mentioned here, that's not coming from direct inhibition of methane production, but just the whole picture of uh, uh, the animal. Based on your understanding of the rumen dynamics and biology, can you hypothesize or at least conceive of other compounds that have yet to be discovered or created that might work? I, I can tell you everyone who is into the methane business in the world is working on that right now, <laughs> including our lab, uh, everyone I know. <laughs> so there will be more compounds, definitely. It will take some years. Um, now, whether they will have the same mode of action, uh, we, we are, of course, looking at different mode of actions as well, whether there will be adaptation to those, whether they will be practical, uh, how much is, are they going to cost. There are tons of questions, a and the example is 3NOP. I mean, it took years and years. Our first paper was 2015, and 10 years later, uh, we still don't have that compound approved uh, here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it will take time before anything comes out. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had uh, mentioned early on in your talk that you th believe that there's like a 70% reduction that's possible mm -hmm. and that with 3NOP you could maybe get 30%. If you were to draw a pie chart, where's the other 40% coming from? Okay, yeah. So. I mean, uh, I talk about this in, in the paper. Let's say you have, I, I have a best case scenario and worst case scenario. So the best case scenario, you can manipulate the diet, forages, starch, and get maybe 10, 15% maximum reduction. Then you add on top of that, maybe <coughs> the 30% reduction by uh, inhibitors. And then you add a second compound that is also effective and there is a synergism or additivity of the effect, so that brings maybe another 10% 10, 10 or so. Uh, so we are now at um, 50 or so percent. And then on top of that, you can add some um, um, maybe genetic manipulation of, uh, or selection for low-emitting uh, animals. 
which is not a dramatic thing. People understand now that the effect is not going to be more than 10% or maximum. But even if you add that, you maybe have some management uh, strategies. Um, um, let's say um, <coughs> longer um, uh, productive life of the animal. That's, that's one actually key. Or improving uh, milk production, for example, or increasing uh, components. So on the intensity basis, you are adding uh, again this, uh, this uh, reduction. And then if we put on top of that manure, uh, then you can get 70 or even higher than 70% reduction. Got it. And the worst case scenario, <laughs> let me finish this. The worst case scenario <coughs> is uh, diet manipulation, 5%, let's say, or no uh, zero. Uh, then you have an additive that there is an adaptation of the microbes over time, so the effect decreases. You don't have synergism or additivity of the second additive, and you have no uh, other tools to, to reduce uh, this emission, so you are looking at a maximum of 20-25% maybe reduction. Mm. You know, you mentioned uh, genetic manipulation of the cow. I'm kind of curious. Selection. Yeah, selection. Uh, could, could we uh, mm. manipulate the microbes uh, genetically? Absolutely. People are looking at that. No okay. one has successfully done it yet. Okay. Who knows? Uh, now that there is so much money into it, people who are outside of animal science and outside of rumen microbiology are getting into yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. And, you know, they may have expertises that we don't have. Exactly. So there, there may be some progress there. But no one in the history of rumen microbiology has been able to manipulate the rumen, yeah. except one case down in Australia where uh, I forgot, uh, Bill, uh, uh, with that plant that uh, they introduced. Oh, no. Mic know. You yeah, know what I I'm know talking, what about. talking yeah. about. Yeah. So that's the only case. But this is a native microbe from the same geographic area, just transferred from one animal to another. Mm. So, yeah. so Alex, at the beginning of the discussion, you also mentioned that there are management practices that could reduce carbon footprint. What would some of those be? Some of those would be, for example, as I said, Im improving uh, lifetime productivity of the animal. Instead of you know, having uh, grown fi five heifers for the same amount of milk production, uh, you, you may have one cow that is not milking for two lactations only, but milking for ten lactations. So that, that can uh, uh, affect uh, these emissions. Having healthier animals, we have shown, uh, <coughs> for example, uh, mastitis. If, if you control mastitis and reduce mastitis, that affects again uh, um, uh, the, the intensity of the emissions because you have a healthier animal that produces more uh, milk. All these uh, kind of uh, uh, interventions can have an effect uh, on the overall, overall picture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Ristoff, this has been a fascinating discussion. Yeah, good. And I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there's going to be many discussions uh, going yeah. forward. And so uh, I really appreciate you uh, uh, joining us today. What I'd like to do is, you know, we've covered a lot of territory. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe pick out one aspect that you'd like the audience to just kind of take away from this conversation. And I'll ask all three of you to do that. And But I'll start with my co-host, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, if you might uh, do that for us. Our last call question is sponsored by AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine, the next generation in amino acid balancing. With AminoSure XM, you can save up to five cents per cow per day on your methionine investment. Try it today and receive an additional 2.5 cents per cow per day savings with Belchem's limited time rebate offer. Contact your Belchem representative to learn more. Yeah, so I, you know, I think for the audience today, you know, the the um, even though it's minor, you know these dietary manipulations. I, I, I think there's a little bit there where we can do to improve things mm -hmm. as nutritionists. Yeah, good point. Bill, any thoughts? There's, there's a in this paper. There's a lot of things in the toolbox that we can use. It's not going to be one thing fixes everything, but there's just a lot of like Clay said, a lot of little things you may be able to do that when you add them all up have a big impact. Yeah. Dr. Ristoff, going to give you the final word. Yeah, um, <coughs> again, uh, we, with so many people working in this area, I think uh, we'll have solutions. My biggest concern is adaptation. Um, maybe we'll have a way around it uh, with different regimen of feeding and uh, 
supplementing and so on, but uh, at, at this point, uh, that's my biggest concern. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. very well. Well, again, it was a very fascinating discussion. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been awesome. Uh, to our loyal listeners, thank you for joining us once again. Uh, we hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun. And I hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.